Welcome to BEFM Drama, where we turn great works of English literature into gripping radio. I'm your host, Joshua Cornwell, and today we're bringing you the first episode in our adaptation of The Most Dangerous Game, an iconic 1924 short story by the American writer Richard Connell that quickly established a permanent place for itself in the pop consciousness of the 20th century. This chilling tale of horror and suspense begins on an inky dark night far out on the Caribbean Sea, where two American big game hunters are sitting together in easy companionship on the deck of their comfortable yacht. See there, Rainsford? Off there to the right. Somewhere. It's a large island. It's rather a mystery. What island is it, Whitney? The old charts call it Ship Trap Island. A suggestive name, isn't it? Sailors have a curious dread of the place. I don't know why. Some superstition. Rainsford tried to peer through the dank tropical night that was palpable as it pressed its thick, warm blackness in upon the yacht. Can't see it. You've good eyes, and I've seen you pick off a moose moving in the brown fall bush at 400 yards. But even you can't see four miles or so through a moonless Caribbean night. Nor four yards. Ugh, it's like moist black velvet. It'll be light enough in Rio. We should make it in a few days. I hope the Jaguar guns have come from Purdy's. We should have some good hunting up the Amazon. Great sport hunting. The best sport in the world. For the hunter, not for the Jaguar. Don't talk rot, Whitney. You're a big game hunter, not a philosopher. Who cares how a jaguar feels? Perhaps the jaguar does. Bah, they've no understanding. Even so, I rather think they understand one thing. Fear. The fear of pain and the fear of death. Nonsense. This hot weather is making you soft, Whitney. Be a realist. The world is made up of two classes. The hunters and the huntees. Luckily, you and I are the hunters. Do you think we've passed that island yet? Uh, I can't tell in the dark. I hope so. Why? The place has a reputation. A bad one. Cannibals? Hardly. Even cannibals wouldn't live in such a godforsaken place. But it's gotten into sailor lore somehow. Didn't you notice that the crew's nerves seemed a bit jumpy today? They were a bit strange, now you mention it. Even Captain Nielsen... Yes, even that tough-minded old Swede who'd go up to the devil himself and ask him for a light. Those fishy blue eyes held a look I never saw there before. All I could get out of him was, this place has an evil name among seafaring men, sir. Then he said to me very gravely, Don't you feel anything? As if the air about us was actually poisonous. Now, you mustn't laugh when I tell you this. I did feel something like a sudden chill. There was no breeze. The sea was as flat as a plate glass window. We were drawing near the island then. What I felt was a a mental chill, a sort of sudden dread. Pure imagination. One superstitious sailor could taint the whole ship's company with his fear. Maybe. But sometimes I think sailors have an extra sense that tells them when they are in danger. Sometimes I think evil is a tangible thing with wavelengths. Just a sound and light half. An evil place can, so to speak, broadcast vibrations of evil. Anyhow, I'm glad we're getting out of this zone. Well, I think I'll turn in now, Rainsford. I'm not sleepy. I'm going to smoke another pipe up on the afterdeck. Uh, good night, then, Rainsford. I'll see you at breakfast. Right. Good night, Whitney. There was no sound of the night as Rainsford sat there, but the muffled throb of the engine that drove the yacht swiftly through the darkness, and the swish and ripple of the wash of the propeller. Rainsford, reclining in a steamer chair, indolently puffed on his favorite pipe. The sensuous drowsiness of the night was on him. It's so dark, he thought, that I could sleep without closing my eyes. The night would be my eyelids. An abrupt sound startled him. Off to the right, he heard it and his ears, expert in such matters, could not be mistaken. Again he heard the sound, and again, somewhere, off in the blackness, someone had fired a gun three times. 
Rainsford sprang up and moved quickly to the rail, mystified. He strained his eyes in the direction from which the reports had come, but it was like trying to see through a blanket. He leapt upon the rail and balanced himself there to get a greater elevation. His pipe, striking a rope, was knocked from his mouth. He lunged for it. A short, hoarse cry came from his lips as he realized he had reached too far and had lost his balance. The cry was pinched off short as the blood-warm waters of the Caribbean Sea closed over his head. He struggled up to the surface and tried to cry out, but the wash from the speeding yacht slapped him in the face and the salt water in his open mouth made him gag and strangle. Desperately, he struck out with strong strokes after the receding lights of the yacht, but he stopped before he had swum fifty feet. A certain cool-headedness had come to him. It was not the first time he had been in a tight place. There was a chance that his cries could be heard by someone aboard the yacht, but that chance was slender, and grew more slender as the yacht raced on. He wrestled himself out of his clothes and shouted with all his power. The lights of the yacht became faint as ever-vanishing fireflies. Then they were blotted out entirely by the night. Rainsford remembered the shots. They had come from the right, and doggedly he swam in that direction, swimming with slow, deliberate strokes, conserving his strength. For a seemingly endless time he fought the sea. He began to count his strokes. He could do possibly a hundred more, and then... Rainsford heard a sound. It came out of the darkness. A high, screaming sound. The sound of an animal in an extremity of anguish and terror. He did not recognize the animal that made the sound. He did not try to. With fresh vitality, he swam towards the sound. He heard it again, and then it was cut short by another noise. Crisp, staccato. Pistol shot, muttered Rainsford, swimming on. Ten minutes of determined effort brought another sound to his ears, the most welcome he had ever heard, the muttering and growling of the sea breaking on a rocky shore. He was almost on the rocks before he saw them. On a night less calm, he would have been shattered against them. With his remaining strength, he dragged himself from the swirling waters. Jagged crags appeared to jut out into the opaqueness. He forced himself upward, hand over hand, gasping, his hands raw. He reached a flat place at the top. Dense jungle came down to the very edge of the cliffs. What perils that tangle of trees that underbrush might hold for him did not concern Rainsford just then. All he knew was that he was safe from his enemy, the sea, and that utter weariness was on him. He flung himself down at the jungle edge and tumbled headlong into the deepest sleep of his life. When he opened his eyes, he knew from the position of the sun that it was late in the afternoon. Sleep had given him new vigor. A sharp hunger was picking at him. He looked about him, almost cheerfully. Where there are pistol shots, there are men. Where there are men, there is food. But what kind of men, he wondered, in so forbidding a place? An unbroken front of snarled and ragged jungle fringed ashore. He saw no sign of a trail through the closely knit web of weeds and trees, it was easier to go along the shore, and Rainsford floundered along by the water. Not far from where he had landed, he stopped. Some wounded thing, by the evidence a large animal, had thrashed about in the underbrush. The jungle weeds were crushed down and the moss was lacerated. One patch of weeds was stained crimson. A small, glittering object not far away caught Rainsford's eye, and he picked it up. It was an empty cartridge. A twenty-two. That's odd. It must have been a fairly large animal, too. The hunter had his nerve with him to tackle it with such a light gun. It's clear that the brute put up a fight. I suppose the first three shots I heard was when the hunter flushed his quarry and wounded it. The last shot was when he trailed it here and finished it. He examined the ground closely and found what he had hoped to find, the print of a hunting boot. They pointed along the cliff in the direction he had been going. Eagerly he hurried along, now slipping on a rotten log or a loose stone, but making headway. Night was beginning to settle down on the island. Bleak darkness was blacking out the sea and jungle when Rainsford sighted the lights. He came upon them as he turned a crook in the coastline, and his first thought was that he had come upon a village, for there were many lights. 
but as he forged along, he saw to his great astonishment that all the lights were in one enormous building, a lofty structure with pointed towers plunging upwards in the gloom. His eyes made out the shadowy outlines of a palatial chateau. It was set on the high bluff, and on three sides of it cliffs dived down to where the sea licked greedy lips in the shadows. Rainsford has been flung from the safety and comfort of his yacht into the blood-warm waters of the Caribbean. By some miracle, he has made it to the shore of a mysterious island, an island where he is not alone, apparently. As our episode ends, Rainsford has stumbled across a house, and not just any house, but a palatial, brightly lit mansion. But who might he find here, living in this place, on this island where pistol shots and frantic screams echo through the inky blackness of the fog-strewn night? Find out tomorrow evening as we bring you part two in our adaptation of The Most Dangerous Game here on BEFM Drama.